As music progressed in the 1960s, one label after another was applied to every new sound that came out, and Baroque rock was one of these, and it came on the heels of the hit song Walk Away Renee by The Left Bank, and we're going to explore their history here on Pop Goes the 60s. <laughs> Now the Beatles gave a slight nod to the Baroque sound with their songs Yesterday and In My Life, but the left bank made it an integral part of their sound, mainly from the use of gentle string arrangements and the use of the harpsichord, two staples in the Baroque period. But before we get into that, let's talk about the left bank's humble beginnings. The band's origins can be traced to the fall of 1965 at World United Studios, where Harry Lukowski ran a studio. Now Lukowski was a session violinist, and he had a son who was a budding songwriter and pianist. Now in the same studio, Tom Finn and Warren David Shirehorse were cutting a single with their band called The Magic Plants called I'm a Nothing. Meanwhile, Lukowski's son, Michael, who went by the stage name of Michael Brown, was cutting a song uh, that he wrote for a group called Christopher and the Chaps. <laughs> It didn't take long for more aspiring musicians to be drawn to the studio. And two of Tom Finn's friends, Steve Martin and George Cameron, started hanging out there as well. Now, Michael Brown had the keys to the studio, and they started rehearsing and just singing. And after some time, Michael's father, Harry, heard them and said, well, maybe we should do something a little more formal here with you guys. So here's the starting lineup. On lead vocals, we have Steve Martin. Tom Finn was on the high harmony vocals. He also played bass. George Cameron took middle harmony. He was playing guitar at this point. Michael Brown was the pianist, and he also did some singing. And then on drums, we had Warren David Shirehorst. Now, as the group was germinating and working on their vocals, which was really became their strength from the get-go, and Michael Brown, who was classically trained on piano, he was more of a classical player, and it sounded much more classical than some of the other guys' leanings were, which were rock music and they were more Beatles Stones and Kinks fans. So the, the music started to gel together as both of those styles of music came together and they started to collaborate and they started working on songs together. The first two songs they started working on were I Haven't Got the Nerve and I've Got Something on My Mind. And these are two great examples of the two different styles of music they came from. One is a little bit more rock, one has got this more Baroque feel to it. I've got something on my mind. Now, both of those songs were written by the group, and it's a good example of the two different directions they were coming from. One is much more of a rock song, one is much, much more has this Baroque feel. Now, all these guys were very temperamental, and from the very get-go, they were not gelling well in the studio. There was always a lot of arguments, and there was, it took a lot to get these songs to the finished forms. Now, in early 1966, Michael Brown absconded to Los Angeles with Warren David Shirehorst, and I think they were looking to just make it rich in the music industry, and they left the band behind. They had really no formal recordings at this point. And before they basically got there, Harry Lukowski had them arrested as they got off the plane and they were sent home. So because of this, Warren David Shirehorse was ousted from the band and they were down to a four piece. So George Cameron moved from guitar to drums and Jeff Winfield was added on guitar at this point. Now back at World United Studios, the four guys continued to work on the songs they'd already started on, mostly working on their vocals. And one song that they continued on was a song called Walk Away Renee. Now they had started recording it a second time and realized that they had a, I think they were very excited about this song and knew it was a good song. After recording it a second time, they weren't happy with the key that it was in and they did it a third time, this time with session musicians. Now, Harry Lukowski, having run, run the studio, he was able to bring in session guys in under the table. 
So this was a very professional sounding recording done very cheaply. And Michael Brown does play on, he plays harpsichord on the track and the other guys do sing on it. Just walk away, Renee. You won't see me follow you. The inspiration for the song Walk Away Renee was a girlfriend that Tom Finn had brought to the sessions. Her name was Renee Fladen. And she hung around for a couple weeks and Michael Brown must have been very taken with her because not only did he write Walk Away Renee, but two other songs. One was called She May Call You Up Tonight, a co-write with Steve Martin and Pretty Ballerina. Walk Away Renee was released as a single with I Haven't Got the Nerve on the B-side. The, the band signed a one single deal with Smash Records and that was for $1,000. Now Smash was a subsidiary of Mercury and at this point the band started doing appearances to help promote the single. They did one appearance at Cousin Brucey's 4th of July concert in 1966 and some other appearances as well. But unfortunately, the single didn't do anything. So after the failure of the single, they all went their separate ways. Good Fortune started to shine down on the band by August 1966 because a Midwestern DJ broke Walk Away Renee and it started to climb the charts, getting all the way up to number five in late 1966. Now at this point, the band had to scramble together to record, to finish recording tracks that they already started to cobble together an album. And at, the, at this point, uh, Warren David Shirehorse had played on some of the tracks, but they needed some session players to help round out the sound. Hugh McCracken was brought in on guitar to play some of the sessions. In addition to David Winfield being added on guitar, Tom Fair was also added as a lyricist. The band had a wonderful cachet of songs that would be perfect for singles, and they chose Pretty Ballerina to follow up Walk Away Renee, and that song got to number 15. This Baroque sound I've been talking about is probably best demonstrated on the next two songs I'm about to play, Shadows Breaking Over My Head and Barterers and Their Wives. So late into the recordings of the album, Jeff Winfield was let go and they brought in a guitar player named Rick Brand and he played on the song Let Go of You Girl. Now that song is the only song where the entire band plays on together. And uh, despite this, this beautiful sound that they were creating, this Baroque sound, they also had a very good rock sound as well. So let's have a look at the album. The first album's called Walk Away Renee, Pretty Ballerina. And this is Rick Brand, the guy I just mentioned. So he's only on one track, he's the guitar player. And uh, it's a beautiful album cover, actually. And the liner notes go into talking about that Baroque sound quite a bit, so the record label is really playing it up a, a, a lot. But aside from the Baroque sound, really the left bank, the value in this band is really the vocals. And these guys were excellent singers, excellent harmonizers, and this is entirely co written by the band. Uh, Tom Fair was a lyricist who did help co-write some of these songs, but the entire band wrote this whole album and it stands up really well. The album was released in January 1967 and got to number 67 on the charts. And at this point, the band started to do some touring. And one of the things that Michael Brown was given, he got the first electric harpsichord which is very difficult to, to keep in tune, by the way. And they started doing some package tours, but not a whole lot. They did some shows with the Beach Boys, the Mamas and the Papas, the Association. They also did a lot of shows by themselves as well. And this was difficult for them because they had to do all the setting up themselves and they didn't have very good equipment. So they had no monitors. They had a hard time recreating the sound from the studio that they created on stage. Now, mind you, these guys were all pretty green players. They were, they were fairly young at their instruments and getting better all the time, Michael Brown being the most accomplished. But Brown started to get dissatisfied with the sound live because they, they just were inexperienced 
and had poor equipment. Now Michael Brown pulled out of the band at this point as a touring member, wanting to just, I guess, stay home and write, a la Brian Wilson. And the guy that they brought in to replace him was a keyboard player named Emmett Lake, who toured with him for about a year. Now, as you might expect, this Baroque rock became somewhat of a fad, and you had other groups capitalizing on this Baroque sound, namely the New Society. This was a group by uh, Randy Sparks. It's basically a, um, a knockoff. It's basically taking the New Christian Minstrels, putting them in these outfits, and calling it Baroque rock. So after Michael Brown pulled out of the touring version of the Left Bank, he wanted to get rid of the whole band, and they obviously couldn't do that. Uh, so what he did is he started up a second Left Bank, now, the, the Left Bank was really set up and managed by Harry Lukofsky. He set up the publishing, and as such, he got a lot of the money from the royalties. And uh, a lot of the members didn't really get a big chunk of that. So Michael Brown started setting up a new Left Bank band. And one of the members of this band was a vocalist named Bert Summer. Uh, Warren David Shirehurst was brought back on drums. And another guy was Michael McKeon, later to be a member of the cast of Laverne and Shirley. So the second version of the Left Bank cut a single called Ivy Ivy, which only made it to 119 on the chart. And the B-side was called And Suddenly. Now Michael McKean did not actually play on this record. I guess it was done by session players. Ivy, Ivy. So once the single was released, Tom, George, and Steve hired a lawyer and they filed a suit against the secondary Left Bank. And uh, the contract, the original contract, was with the entire, the original four guys. So they couldn't really do this. So there was a cease and desist put out on that single, Ivy Ivy, which probably didn't help it chart very well. But the problem with that was that this led to repercussions later on where DJs were reluctant to play the left bank stuff because there was a cease and desist uh, order out there. Now, at this point, Steve, Tom, and George did win the lawsuit and they were given full rights to the band name. And uh, at this point also, Michael Brown fell out with his father, Harry. So things were hitting the fan here. The Left Bank was still touring, but they were still touring without Michael Brown at this point. They did release another single called She May Call You Up Tonight, and that only got to number 120. Now, most instances, and with most bands, this would probably mark the end of the band. But at this point, later in 67, Michael Brown reunited with the group and had a reconciliation. And he started working on another single. This one was called Desiree. So Desiree only got to number 98 anyway. And it seems that there was somewhat of a hangover from that cease and desist order that was plaguing the future releases of the Left Bank. And it was at this point, late 1967, where Rick Brand left the band. And the band was now officially a three-piece band. Now looking to add some other members at this point, Alan Merrill was approached and he did quite a lot of rehearsing with the band, hoping to become a full-time member. But he wasn't added as a full-time member. Uh, he's the guy that eventually wrote I Love Rock and Roll for Joan Jett. They brought in Tom Fair back in, the lyricist, and they started working toward another album. Fair, who was originally a lyricist, he started playing some keyboards and guitar with them. He went out on tour with them on keyboards as well. Now, in June 1968, they released their next single, and it had been almost a year since they released a single, and this was called Dark is the Bark. Maybe sensing that the previous single was a little bit too mellow, they did a little poppier single called Goodbye Holly, backed with Sing Little Bird Sing, and that was in November 1968, but that one didn't chart either. And now she's gone away, yes I know in my mind I remember all the love So the second album here is called Left Bank 2, but this album has all original material except for one song and it's probably more consistent than their first album. And it's, it's got some rather adventurous songs on it, such as There's Gonna Be a Storm. i
Now that last song, Brian Hotel, sounds a little bit like the Kinks. So let's have a look at the album packaging here. We have them in these elaborate costumes. And both on the front, we see a guy with the hood in the back here. And here in the back, it's almost like a the ghost of Michael Brown there, I guess. So Brown does appear on two tracks, uh, as does Hugh McCracken. And, but the rest of the album is written by these guys, and they play all the instruments as well. So one other additional vocalist they had on this record was a guy named Steve Tallarico, better known as Steven Tyler, later of Aerosmith. So he was a couple years behind these guys in high school, went to the same high school, and he was brought in to help on some of the backing vocals. So anyway, this album didn't chart. Despite the excellent production quality, the excellent instrumentation, which was done by the band, and the excellent writing. Now, meanwhile, Michael Brown was busy with a new band called Montage. And this was a band that was basically a four-piece band, and Brown was essentially the, the songwriter, and he played on the productions, but he wasn't really a singer on any of these. And this is a reissue of this album, which came out in 1969. So if you compare the vocal stylings to uh, the previous couple albums I showed, this one doesn't really compare, although there's a couple very good songs on here, such as the single, I Shall Call Her Mary. So there are other couple quality songs on here that Left Bank fans may like, and they sound like this. My love's eyes are softer than sun glow, lit like a rainbow, my love. Something is happening outside. Remember the time when we climbed in the trees? Flowers blooming under the trees. Lying there, my love waits for me. Now, if you compare the lead vocalist, Bob Stewart, on this record to Steve Martin, there's really no comparison. And though Stewart does a good job on some of these songs, there are some songs that Brown wrote that really aren't in his range or really suited for his voice. For example, She's Alone. She picks the mirror off the floor and then she sees. So by the end of 1968, early 69, this album was released, late 68, didn't chart. This was released early 69, didn't chart. But you would think maybe things are gonna fall apart and just fizzle out altogether here, but who returns but Michael Brown? And together with Tom Finn, George Cameron, and Steve Martin, they start recording some radio commercials. <laughs> It's great that they were getting work at all at this point, but one of the commercials they did was for Coca-Cola and they really nailed it. So the commercials didn't do much to enhance uh, their image at all. Uh, but later in 1969, they reconvened in the studio for yet another single. And this is again with Michael Brown. And this is a song called Myra with the B-side pedestal. This single did not chart. Despite doing a little bit of soundtrack work that remained unreleased, the band just started to wind down at this point and go their separate ways. Now, it wasn't until a year later that they were approached to do some more soundtrack work. And this is for a movie called Hot Parts. And there was a soundtrack album that came out. This is on Buddha Records. I looked for this movie on IMBD. I couldn't find the title anywhere, but I did some research and it was indeed released but it was a very limited release. And those were the days with a movie that obscure, you could still have a soundtrack album come out. So this album has two songs by the original Left Bank on here. One's called Two by Two and Love Songs in the Night. 
And because the name Love Bank was owned by Smash Records and the name was kind of poison, they just build this these two songs under the name of Steve Martin. Now, that was pretty much the end of the band. Michael Brown went on to form the band Stories, and they had a number one song called Brother Louie, though Michael Brown had left before that song came out. There was another album, a reunion album, that was recorded in 1978. It was originally going to be called Strangers on a Train. It didn't get released. This came out in 1986 on uh, the Bomb Caruso label uh, with a different title. And this was a very limited release and didn't really do much of anything. Let me show you my first introduction to this band. And this was a Rhino Records compilation called The History of the Left Bank. So this has their hits on it, their singles, plus the Steve Martin single from this Hot Parts soundtrack and the song Brother Louie by Stories. So it's a really great compilation of the band. It's got wonderful liner notes here as well. And it has a discography that is just to die for if you're into that kind of thing. So this, if, you get, if you're looking for something on vinyl, this is a great starting point. That came out in 1985, I believe. Bomb Caruso released this wonderful compilation in 1988. It's called, and suddenly, it's The Left Bank. So this has 18 songs on it, all their best stuff. But this is a great one if you can find it. So there were some notable reunions of these guys. Most, most important was the 2001 reunion where Michael Brown joined them. And unfortunately, all four original members have passed away. But some good news is this album is being released in 2022 in February. I'll have some details below as they come in. And it's great that this album will finally get a proper release. So one thing I almost forgot to mention, if you're looking to get some physical media on these guys, this CD called There's Gonna Be a Storm is one of the best things you can get. It's the complete recordings from 66 to 69, and it's got excellent liner notes, uh, very good song quality, and a wonderful history of the band. So this has got almost everything you would ever need by them. Now, um, one of the things about The Left Bank, uh, this was one of my most requested videos. So these guys really, there's a lot of people that really wanted to know more about the Left Bank and their music, and I can totally see why. Lots of talent. These guys just didn't quite have the camaraderie that a lot of other bands have to really take it further. And uh, there was a lot of start and stops here in the band's history, but still they left us with some wonderful music, and that's what I like to focus on. So thanks for watching. Plenty more to come here on Pop Goes the 60s.